Hello, my name's Julian Edgar, and I'm the author of a whole lot of books on modifying cars. Here's one of them, Optimising Car Performance Modifications, how you can make sure your car performance modifications are going in the right direction and are actually achieving what you want. What I want to talk about in today's video are water-air intercoolers, and I want to talk particularly about the idea of thermal mass. Now, I've done another video that talks about how intercoolers actually work on road cars. And because boost events are occurring only as a relatively small proportion of the total time that you're on the road, you have little episodes of boost whenever you put your foot down, it's not on all the time, then an intercooler typically works by both absorbing heat, which it then gets rid of later on when you're not on boost, and also dissipating heat real time. People tend to forget about the absorbing of heat bit. Now, the reason that those two ideas are relevant to water-air intercoolers is the beauty of a water-air intercooler is it has an enormous amount of thermal mass. Thermal mass, the higher the thermal mass, the more heat you can dump into something and its temperature rises only very slowly. And water has a very, very high specific heat. That means you can put a lot of energy into it and it goes hotter only very, very slowly. The obvious example is, is a kettle that you might boil, an electric kettle you might boil for a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. Despite having over a kilowatt being dumped into it, and it's only probably a few litres, it still takes ages to get really, really hot. Uh, especially ages when you're considering how much power you are using. So the beauty of a water-air intercooler system in a car, a road car, is basically the temperature of the intake air varies very little whether you're on boost or off boost. So let's say the day is 40 degrees C, a really hot day, you know, 100 and 105 degrees Fahrenheit, something of that sort. You're driving around, the intake air temperature is probably pretty hot as well. It might be 45, a bit over 110 or something of that sort. And then you put your, your boot into it. You, you put your foot down, you get maximum boost. Now, if the intercooler is working well, you'll find that the temperature will rise only one or two degrees, the intake air temperature. Why? Because that heat is being dumped into the water which is circulating through the system. Now I said circulating, and here's where it becomes really, really interesting. Years and years ago, I built my own water-air heat exchanger for a turbo car. It was a cylindrical uh, design. It had lots of copper tubes stacked like straws, like a, a steam locomotive boiler, if you know about those. And the intake air passed through those copper tubes. The, the complete cylinder was filled with water, and that water was pumped in and out of the cylinder to a front mount to a radiator, a separate radiator at the front. And I was tuning the action of the pump which circulated that water. This was a little 60, 660 cc, 0.66 litres, three cylinder, but I was running a lot of boost, 20, 21 psi boost. So I was tuning the action. When should I have the pump running and when should I have it not running? And I was measuring intake air temperature with a fast response probe. And to my absolute astonishment, I found that in normal road driving, I could leave the pump switched off and the intake air temperature was, was largely the same. So what was happening, every time I was on boost, it was dumping the heat into the water, which was into the, in the heat exchanger, in this copper heat exchanger. It was also dumping the heat into those copper tubes. And so the intake air temperature didn't rise because all the heat was being stored by the intercooler uh, thermal mass. And then as I kept driving, that would gradually dissipate into the intake air temperature and no doubt radiate as well into the engine bay. Now, how long could you leave the pump off when you're on boost? So if you climbed a really big hill at full boost, then the heat was being dumped into the intercooler core, and then gradually that water in the intercooler core was starting to warm up. Obviously it has to warm up if the heat's being dumped into it. I found that if I was on full boost for more than about 20 seconds, then you really had to have the pump running to get rid of that warm water and replace it with cool water coming in from the, the, the front mount, to the radiator, the front mount heat exchanger. So in that case, the thermal mass of the heat exchanger, because it was full of water, was sufficient to get rid of any temperature spikes that were occurring on the intake air temp, even when I was on boost, until I was on boost for a much longer period, up say a very long hill. You can see that if you've got say five or six liters of water 
in your water air intercooling system that includes the amount of water in the heat exchanger under the under the bonnet under the hood that includes the amount of water that's in the front mount uh, radiator that includes the amount of water that's in the lines you can see especially if you have the pump just circulating slowly you've got an enormous amount of thermal mass in that system and basically in normal road driving you'll see almost no temperature spikes at all one of my current cars, uh, a little Honda, uh, again, I suppose it's another small engine car. Um, I, I'm monitoring intake air temperature all the time. Uh, I really have to be sitting at absolutely full boost um, for, uh, for a long time before the intake air temperature even, even changes. The water air intercooling system really does get rid of all those spikes. Now, what's the downside of that? Well, if you come to a halt, you've been driving the car, you come to a halt, you park it in the city or something like that, under the bonnet, under the hood, it's really hot, it's a hot day, basically all the water in the system will gradually rise and rise in temperature as it absorbs the heat from the surroundings. So if it's a hot day and if you've parked the car, you get back in, you look at the intake air temperature, it's really high already because the water in the system has got warm. The water in the system might be at 110 degrees, uh, 40 degrees odd in terms of Celsius. So in that case, having a lot of thermal mass is a disadvantage because you have to drive the car for quite a long time before that intake air temperature will drop uh, below what it had risen to when you were parked. So it swings and roundabouts. Uh, a system with a lot of thermal mass and a water air system has got the most thermal mass of anything that's convenient to put into a car will really knock off all the spikes off temperature uh, as you're on and off boost driving around say in a city or on, on a country road. But conversely, the negative is when you're parked, you can see that that intake air temperature will then be high when you drive off because all the water in the system has got hot as well and that needs to cool down first. For me, I think water air systems in a road car are really, really good, um, but you've just got to be aware of that, that slight disadvantage in that particular situation. Of course, if the car's been parked overnight and you drive off, well, it, the water's not going to be hot. It'll just be whatever the ambient temperature is. It's just that situation where you've been driving hard and then park and it's a hot day, then you will see that water rise in temperature. Thermal mass, having a high thermal mass in a road car intercooling system still has uh, advantages that I think uh, outweigh any of those disadvantages. Of course, the system's a bit heavier too if you're watching weight, and it's a little bit more complex pumps and, and two heat exchangers, not just one. But the huge benefit is thermal mass. You will never ever get a really high temperature spike in the intake air that's going to your engine. So you can run more boost, you can run more timing, and you've got a, a greater safety uh, zone towards detonation. Thank you.